who you belong to. It's about letting the enemy know he'll never win. The Lord won't let him win in your life. He won't let you fail. He's never gone too far where he can't find you. And he will always find you. He will always chase you down. He will always go after you. He left the 99 to go after the one. Don't think for a moment he won't chase you down. Don't think for a moment you've gone too far. Created us, God, a clean heart. Created us, God, a clean heart. And renew a right spirit within us. Cause us, Lord, to fall in love with you again. Cause us to fall in love with you all over again. Be first in our life. You are first love. Our first love.
walking with the Lord in faith is never really a feeling. No. It's not. But the Lord takes pleasure in manifesting himself to us. And sometimes that comes in the form of a feeling, his presence. I don't know about you, but I felt a shift. I felt a shift. I felt something that was a little bit different when we started to lift him up. Not that we weren't lifting him up before, but there was a newfound emphasis on it. <laughs> of lifting him up. When you presented yourself to the Lord at these altars, wow. Now God has always been and always will be after the heart of men. And when we give that to him willingly, yes. <laughs> I don't think there's anything more that pleases God is when we willingly give our lives to him, our will, our desires, our emotions, our hearts, and everything that we are. He's looking for those who will willingly choose him. Amen. 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 I think that's what we did today. Yes. Amen. I want to give the Lord a hand clap. Yeah. He's good. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Amen. He is good. Amen. Amen. I said this to the worship team beforehand. We were talking in service, and there was some. You know, sometimes there's a focus on the quality of music, if you will, right? And I love them. You know, they're doing really good. I've given them a lot of praise for what they're doing and doing what they're doing with the lack of um, a full team and everything. And uh, it is just, I, I mentioned to them, you know, I said that the heart, listening for the heart of the music yes. more than the quality of the music, like the hearts that are behind it. I'm listening for that more than anything. And that has to do with us too, yeah. right? Yeah. On, on Sunday morning when they're practicing or even Saturday or whatever the case may be, obviously that matters then too, their unity and everything like that. They're, they, they got a huge job here, leading yeah. us into the presence of the Lord. Yeah. But then we come and join in and as we give our hearts yeah. and unify with what's going on up here and we unify as a body and we begin to bring our allegiance to him, our worship to him, um, our obedience to him, our struggles to him, all of those things, and we present those things to him, he has to show up. Amen. Want to know why? Because <laughs> he has to follow his word. Amen. Right? Amen. When there's unity, right, it will be as the oil that dripped down yes. the yes. beard of yes. Aaron. You'll find that in Psalm 133. Yes. That it would be the, the oil or the presence or the Holy Ghost showing up touching lives. Amen? Amen? As we unify. That's why we express over and over again the importance of unity, right? In, in ministries, right? In people that things are doing, right? There's certain principles that God has to follow. It would behoove us well to learn those principles. Because if we learn those principles, right? Then we don't have to wonder why we'll struggle or if something comes upon us, right? We're like, okay, hey, Maybe I need to check myself. What's going on here, right? We can I, I can bring some unity to this, you know. And and, and Marge, I'll always remember the the prophecy of the lump, yes. right? That we're going to move forward. She reminds me all the time, right? The prophecy of the lump that I, that we're going somewhere and we're going somewhere together, yes. right? Amen. Moses led the, the the children of Israel to the promised land, right? as a team now some fell along the way right and you can read that in first corinthians 10 on your own time but that's not my, the moral of my story here yeah. right some fell along the way right for all different kinds of reasons disobedience we'll just sum it up like that right but in obedience she was still leading a group of people to the promised land and that promised land it, I, it, i've heard it preached a thousand ways till sunday a lot of different things, right? Your destiny here on earth, or it could be heaven, or whatever the case may be. All of those things probably apply. You know that there's more than one application to God's word sometimes, right? And so, right? And, 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 and 
us walking in unity will tell us how we're going to get to the promised land and yes. moving forward in one lump. Amen? Yes. And that has to do with each and every person taking personal accountability and responsibility for your walk. Amen? Yes. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Oh, yes. He is good. Hallelujah. All the time. Thank you, worship team. Yes. God bless you. Thank you, Delia. Yeah. A nice, a nice addition up here. This is good. I'm, I'm liking that. It's already going, and I'm going to cast the devil out of that thing after we get out of service. We tried during service. It wasn't cooperating. <laughs> and what I mean by that, just so you, those of you who don't know, um, for whatever reason, that thing records vertical and horizontal, however it sees fit. And I was fidgeting it during the whole first song, and I can tell that what I was doing was affecting what's going on in the worship service too. So forgive me for that, please, um, because I was distracted and going in a different direction. And um, I think it's important to all unify, but I noticed what was going on there, and I tried that. It took about five to ten minutes to try and correct it, and I finally gave up. And I know that we got a wizard, Alan, if you're watching, we got a wizard <laughs> of social media that, though it's reco uh, recording uh, the wrong way right now, and I'm probably sideways uh, for our online um, group that, that may or may not be watching right now, um, though I may be sideways right now, Alan is able to download it and correct it later. Oh. So it will be, it will be corrected. So um, yeah, yes. praise the Lord for that. <laughs> So yeah, so I was getting in because that thing has a mind of its own. One day, one Sunday, it'll it'll record the right way, and then one Sunday it will not, and it just kind of does what it does, and that's whatever, you know. Uh oh. Not today either. <laughs> not today either. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry. I just Devil, not today either. Last week, I preached a message um, called Devil Not Today. Yeah. I did not intend for this to be a part two, if you will. Um, and really, I had no idea this morning where we were going um, until, you know, I sat down and spent some time with the Lord um, early this morning and uh, found out that, you know, I just didn't feel, well, you know, Sunday I didn't really give this much thought, but this morning I kind of was uh, thinking about this and I put some consideration into it and I really didn't feel like I got out. You ever said something, you tried to explain something and you just didn't get it out the way you wanted to? I think everything thing last week was perfectly applicable. Uh, no, no problems there. But I just feel like the enemy kind of doubled down, if you will. So I feel like I'm gonna double down. Yes, amen. Why not? Good. You know? So Good. I think that he um, uh, is kind of working overtime on some things that are going on in this ministry. I kind of see it, sense it, uh, know what's going on both personally and corporately, and um, I'm over it, to be quite honest with you, okay. because I feel like we're going somewhere, and so we're doing something, and I'm not giving up. How about no. that? So, Amen. yeah, I'm not giving up, and I'm not going to quit it, and uh, the devil is a liar, liar. <laughs> the father of lies, and uh, has been a, a liar from the beginning. Yeah. So if I can just recap, I, I really got to get into this. I might go a little over 12 if you guys can. I, that, um, anyways, it's already 11.30, so I'm going to get right into this. Recap a little last week. Matthew 16, we talked about it. I'm not going to read the entire church. But basically, um, the, 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 the revelation that Peter got, um, that Jesus asked when he asked, um, uh, uh, who do men say that I am? And he said, some say that John the Baptist, some say Elijah. And he said, uh, who do you say that I am? And he's talking to his disciples. And Peter jumped up and answered. And he says, but you are, uh, the, uh, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Um, and Jesus was excited. And he said, blessed are you, Simon Mark Jonah, for flesh and blood had not revealed that to you, but, um, but my father in heaven. And, um, and on this rock, I will build my church and the gates of Hades or hell will not prevail against that. And so Peter had a revelation from God that Jesus is the Christ, the son of the living God. 
And revelation is what he builds his church on, right? Like the understanding of who he is and the revealing of who he is, that he is the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, right? That that is what he builds his church on, that his church is submissive to him and to understand who he is, that he is that one who is high and lifted up, lofty in the heavens, the one who spoke all creation into existence, is worthy of your worship. It's a revelation. It's an understanding of who he is. And it's our responsibility that we respond to that, right? Once that happens, right? So that the church is, I talked about this, is the ecclesia or the called out ones. We are called out of darkness and into light and out of this world's kingdom and out of, uh, out of this world's kingdoms and into his kingdom, right? Do you know that the Bible says that the church is a country? Like it is a country without physical borders, Right? Like, we're called out of this world and into this. So we are really, uh, technically not of this world. And so the attack from the devil on our people in this ministry is a testament that we are going in the right direction. We talked a little bit about that. I feel these attacks. He's taking people out of services. He's taking people, um, he, I see things, a little, you know, little um, uh, snides there, or a little, you know, um, uh, disorder here or there or I see kind of things and it's like it's important that we kind of like go over this because it's so important right like his church is built he said he is a god this was me okay I'll just speak to about myself for a minute I remember one time I, I came from a very prideful stubborn background you can talk about my what talk to my wife all about it she'll tell you everything a very stubborn prideful background that I had the answers and I knew everything right and it was like my way or the highway and I'm still kind of like that. But anyways, so it was a joke. Um, <laughs> Sally goes, no, it's not. <laughs> so anyways, <laughs> so, so, you know, but this thing, so the, the, the Lord, when I was dealing with something about the lack of submission and the understanding of authority, right, in my own life, right, in my understanding of, of, of operating in church life and operating that there is an order in the house and that there is order in this world and that there is order in the family and that there is order here in governments and all those types of things that God has designed order and our ability to recognize and submit to that is paramount to our moving forward right like we need to get it so to speak right we need a revelation from heaven in order to follow that and as we um, uh, walk so in my own walk right I came from that and it was very difficult and my background was is that I had a bad view of authority, right? I had a bad light of authority in my life. I, dis I, 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 I hated everything that was authoritative in my life. I hated bosses. I hated police officers. I hated this. I hated that. Because authority represented something that was trying to do something in my life. But when, with God, with his grace, with his loving kindness, his Holy Spirit and his teaching, he showed me that that's important to to you know, follow and be submissive to and to understand that submission is such a bad word. Like I've probably said it and you're probably, there might be some getting irritated about it. It's not a bad word. It's like it's important and it's good and it's it's healthy for us, right? To understand that and to do those things. Um, and I'm not talking about um, in word only, but also in deed too, right? Like we should follow up with our word. Like when we say something good, that's one part, that's one step. But there is a pseudo submission, if you will, right? Like a, yeah, I'll tell you what you want to hear, but I'll do something else, you know, or kind of that direction, you know? And so it's like, no, 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 no. When you say something, you should follow up with it, right? Like it's back up with, actions are way more important than any type of words, right? Yeah. So, so anyways, so we talked about that a little bit. So, but as we take ground in both our own lives and the communities around us and there's going to be a greater demand on our lives. And we've talked about that in other messages, right? Like as we go forward, and whenever you progress forward in the kingdom, when I talk about progress forward, there's another uh, application of the land, the promised land, right? The land of Canaan can actually be a, 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 a type of your own soul, right? Like you're actually taking land back. You remember when Joshua crossed over the Jordan and he began to on a microcosm level, Right? You can look at that and say, J Joshua was told to go take that army and go take that army. And as he defeated that, he began to get more land back. And land is synonymous, actually, with the soul. Yeah. Getting your soul back, anyways. 
I don't want to go down that road too much. That's another message for another day. That'll take me down on the walk to uh, to explain that. But um, the devil is going to and is tempting us in a greater capacity. Perry Stone mentioned this, right? He talked about last day attacks. He talked about his dad. His dad named Fred. I think it was Fred. For some reason, Fred rings a bell. But anyways, his dad had gone to be with the Lord. And Perry Stone has talked often about his dad. And he talked about how in the last days, and I had a prophetic gifting on their life, that there would be many more attacks. Like people would be dealing with things that they don't normally deal with. Right. Like, And in the last days, as you approach the last days, and as you get closer to these things, it's like the demonic activity gets a lot more of what's going on in the world. You know, there's like a lot of spiritual things going on in the world. And it begins to affect us in a, in a way that we probably wouldn't have, excuse me, otherwise realized, right? And so these things are kind of going on. We're actually seeing these things. So it is paramount that we are subject to the Holy Spirit's work and deliverance of our hearts. It is, when I say paramount, everybody understand, right? It is of supreme importance. Right. Like as a child of God, like <laughs> I don't know how to emphasize this anymore. As a child of God, that we are subject to the Holy Spirit's work in our life, that we allow him to do and accomplish what he wants to do. It's okay to struggle. I want to make that clear. It's okay to go through those things. I remember struggling. I remember failing God. I remember messing up. I remember crying on my bed. I remember saying, God, I don't want to do this anymore. Or God, I don't want to feel this way anymore. Or God, I don't want to keep, you know, bashing my head against this or going against that. I don't want to do those things. Guess what? God loves that heart. Because that's a heart that wants to please God. Stumbling and struggling is okay. I'm not saying, I'm not trying to be condemn, condemning here. But to say that that's just the way I'm made isn't going to cut it. No. Okay? That, to say that that's just how I am is not okay. You, what you're saying is, if you're saying that, is if I, that's just the way I'm made, then, then God, the God who knows me, the God who created me, the one who knows me better than I know myself, doesn't know how to fix me. Hello, he created you. <laughs> you know, he has the answer. He's the antidote. He is the source of life. He has the ability to undo what has been done through the fallen creation. Right. Okay? So it is paramount that we're, that we're subject to him and that we allow him to do things. Because guess what? He is the good physician. He is the one that heals us. I'm sorry, I've got wire problems. He is the good physician and he is the one that heals us. He is the one that undoes and knows how to correct and change us and transform us. Right. Amen. So I'm going to get right into this because I can keep going about that. John 14 is our scripture for today. And I did, I kind of really kind of short, cut this short because the rest didn't apply. But anyways, I'll just read this real quick. And now I have told you before it comes that when it comes to pass that you may believe, I will no longer talk much with you for the ruler of this world is coming, but he has nothing in me. Jesus said this, right, when he was talking about giving them peace, about, you know, letting them know that, you know, that the Son of God must, you know, go and perish. And they're, you know, th this is kind of like contrary to them. They're like wondering what's going on with this. But I just kind of want to get into this. The other things really didn't apply. The ruler of this world is the prince of the power of the air who works in the sons of disobedience. It's actually clarified in Ephesians 2, chapter, Ephesians 2, verse 2. It says that that word of uh, power is actually authority, and Satan has been given a level of authority to, according to Scripture, work in the sons of disobedience. Before I became a son of God, guess what? Before you became a son or a daughter of God, right? Before you were born again, you were a child of disobedience. What do you mean, Pastor? What do you mean? I was, I was fallen. I was part of the fallen creation. And the enemy was able to influence and go through my life. Now, you say, you might say, like, I'll use Sally as an example if I could. I, I had a very bad background with drugs and stuff like that. I don't think Sally has, from my knowledge, right, that I, that I know her, right? She doesn't have that. So, we would, well, Sally wasn't nearly as the heathen that I was. Okay, <laughs> it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter how good you were in the world because your level of morality is not the Lord's level of morality. What well, God's level of morality is sinless perfection. It, you know, so every fallen creature is fallen short of the glory of God. He doesn't care what flavor of popsicle he gets you with. He just cares that he gets you. He doesn't care how he gets you, right? He cares that he gets you. 
So your, your fallen nature and your background and your um, sin before you came to Christ is much different than mine. But don't compare it, no. right? Sin. We're all fallen. We're all fallen short of the glory of God. So we were all going to the broad road of destruction. Right? Right? And I was subject to the uh, to the uh, to the prince of the power of the air. He was influencing my life, and he was doing things through me, right? But Jesus is sinless. Satan having authority over man through the fall, that God gave His only Son, sinless, and Satan having crucified a sinless man has now forfeited His right to inflict death on all who become His property through redemption. Do you get what I'm saying? When, when, when the enemy crucified Christ on the cross, see, the enemy had influence, he had power, he had authority through the fallen creation. And everybody after Adam, right? The first Adam, and then everybody after him were in fallen creation. And all of us have sinned. So all of us, the enemy had legal right to. He had legal access to. Okay? That's what's really going on. When the enemy crucified Christ, Christ was sinless perfection. Yes. He forfeited his authority. Right. Yeah. He forfeited his authority because he crucified someone that wasn't subject to death. Amen. Because so remember when Jesus said this, he says, You don't kill me. You don't crucify me. I actually lay my life down. Yes. I give it over. Yeah. I hand it to you to let you do this. Yeah. I can call on thousands of legions and angels, and I don't believe you even have to go through this. You know, is basically what he was saying. Sinless perfection is Jesus Christ. So when he, so when the enemy crucified Jesus without the legal right to, right, right the enemy has then forfeited his right to all of us right. yeah. who are been born again through redemption. Hallelujah. He forfeited his right to us, right? That when we are born again, washed in the blood of Christ, yes. by faith have been punished with Christ when Christ was crucified we were crucified this is Romans 6 when Christ was crucified we were crucified when he was raised guess what we were raised too right and that's another message for another day as well but uh, that is something that has happened inside of our lives right that we have that we are born again we are part of him and where he is we are Amen. there is nothing within Jesus to pull on this is what Jesus says here comes the enemy but he has nothing in me Jesus being sinless perfection had nothing to tug on. He didn't have greed inside of his heart. The enemy could come, he could bring his influence, but he didn't have greed to tug on. He didn't have jealousy to tug on. He didn't have lust to pull on. He didn't have disobedience, stubbornness, pride, envy, strife, and all those things to pull on. The enemy can come, what Jesus was saying is the enemy can come all he wants, but he doesn't have anything to tug on inside of me. He doesn't have anything inside of me that he can grab a hold of that I'm going to go for. There's no bait that Satan can use that I will bite. See what I'm saying? Yeah. He, what he's buying or what he's selling, I'm not buying. It ain't working with me because inside of my heart, inside of Jesus' heart, there was nothing. There was nothing. Okay? But we're a little bit different, right? We're a little bit different because... When we're born again, you can go to the point too. When we're born again, right? You can take the man out of Egypt, but it's a process to take process to take Egypt out of the man. Right. 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 You can take the man out of Egypt. It was easy, right? The Lord, when he when when I was born again, I recognized God's work in my life, and He like wow, He like revealed Himself, and it's like I call upon the name of the Lord, and it's like bam, all these emotions and all the weight of sin lifted off my shoulders, and God. You know, set me free and he uh, uh, saved me from my sin. It's like the recognition and the re revelation of that. I mean, I weep for weeks. What for weeks? I used to go to the altar and get saved every week. Right? And then we talked about that, right? Like every week, it's like, wow, this is cool. I'm going to keep coming. I'm going to recognize my sin and I recognize what Jesus did for me. Amen. All of the disobedience, all of the things yeah. to know what, what I've done and where I've been. It's like, wow, okay, now I'm set free. Now I'm symbolically taken out of Egypt, Amen. right? And I'm brought into this journey with him. However, Egypt's still in me. I had 33 years of the world inside of me before I got born again. 
I got Egypt inside of me, right? And this is that walk through the wilderness, right? That walk through the wilderness that the Israelites had gone through. We, we go through it symbolically as well, right? We go through that learning what pleases the God, pleases God. We're walking toward our destiny um, inside of the land of Canaan, our promised land, or walking with him. And as we walk with him and as we're led by him, we recognize and we see God as, now you got to see God. This is why it's important to see him as high and holy and lifted up, right? And as Isaiah 6 says, right, that we would see him like that. Because I don't know about you, but when I first was born again, I like had questions. You know, did anybody else have questions for a very big and complicated God, right? Like, I'm not the only one, right? And it's like, if you meet God, like, you get these revelations. If you meet God and you're omnipotent, right, all-powerful, and you're able, why don't you? Like, what, what, like why don't you do it? Right. You know, and so you begin, I call it God as a genie in a bottle, right? Like, like sometimes we do that, right? Like, why aren't you showing up? If you're able, why don't you? Right? We do that sometimes to God. And it's like that kind of like, you know, it's like this question that you have. And so that's not how God works, right? It's not God as a genie in a bottle. God actually allows our circumstances and the things we go to and the things that are inside of us to be fished out of us and dealt with. Amen. Like they're they're meant to be dealt with. Right. They go, they go, they, God allows the circumstances of our life to kind of reveal things, right? The Israelite circumstances of going through the wilderness without the food they had in Egypt right. was rubbing them the wrong way. And their, 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 their issues were coming out, right. their heart, and it was being revealed to them. Now we have a different, we're in a different dispensation, if you will. And we have the Holy Ghost with us. We have the blood of Christ that's made us righteous. It's completely different now. But what is going on is those things are still revealed in us. And as they're revealed in us, we give them over to God. Right? right? Deliverance in the New Testament is synonymous with salvation. Right? right? That we need to be deliverance. And everybody talks about the deliverance of devils and demons and all those things. And and, and, and there's a time for that, and I and praise God that he does that and all that thing. Why don't we just get real and just deal with, you know, the things that are going on inside of us. Like, we need, you know, to be set free. Like, we need, you know, some things kind of taken out of our hearts, right? That we would be set free and all those things, right? right. So you can take the man out of Egypt, but it's a process to take Egypt out of the man. Repentance is paramount. Repentance is important, right? That we would have a change of mind which would lead to a change in action. Like, you know, like the scripture says, let us sit down and let us reason together and let us see if your sins are as made as crimson, as, you know, and that they can be made and they can be washed as white as snow. Like they, they can be, but let us sit down and reason because sometimes we like to justify or we like to, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Is to kind of like reproject, like, hey, don't look at me. Look in a different direction. Like, you know, God, you're dealing with me. God, you're dealing with me. Oh, let's let's look in a different direction because I'd rather not deal with that. I'd rather not give you that. You know, like, uh, I know you want that, but sorry, I'm holding on to that. No, no, no. God would say, I like, I'd like to have that now. Right. You know, like this is time. This is time to deal with it. As it's coming to the surface, it's time to work on that, right? So I try, as a preacher, I try to stay away from behavior modification. I mean, I know that there's some things that we just shouldn't do, right? And there's some things that the uh, Holy Spirit allows us to not do. But but staying away from behavior, behavior modification is key, right? Because cutting off fruit, while it's important to allow, it's important to allow the Holy Spirit to get to the root, right? right? Like if we can cut fruit off all day, we can say, hey, you know, you need to quit doing this, and you need to quit doing that, and you need to quit doing that, and boy, you need to act right, and you need to do this. But that's not how the Holy Spirit works. What's in the root of why you think that that's okay? What, what's in the root that kind of leads you to that behavior? What's in the root that gets you to such and such, right? Like there's something going on inside the heart that leads to that. And hey, if you give that to God, I know a physician in heaven that will, that will gladly deal with that. And he'll gladly surgically remove and correct that. Guess what? Too Here's the best part. Free of charge. Yes. Like it just takes your surrender. Mm -hmm. Like it just takes your willingness. Yes. And God will like, boom, let's do that. Let's heal that area. 
let's let's take that wound, that thing that's kind of eating you up and causing you to kind of go back into that cycle, and let's work on that. Amen. Let's allow you to be healed in that area, right? Yes. What's binding us up? What do we do that when we walk away and get alone, do we sit there and say, I wish I wouldn't have said or done that? Am I the only one? I wish I wouldn't have said it or said that. Like, I wish I wouldn't have came out that way, or I wish I wouldn't have done it that way. I wish I wouldn't have done that action or whatever the case may be. Yeah. Like, like, what is it, right, that, that you recognize that comes off your lips or go, it goes on and privately at your home? Like, what is going on that the Lord wants to deal with, right? Because those things, the Lord wants to heal those areas. Right. The Lord wants to, will, he wants you to willingly give them up. Is anybody with me today? Amen. I'm going to tell you right now, he is a healer of those who wants to do that. He's a deliverer of anyone. And I'm not talking, I'm not preaching behavior modification. I'm preaching yielding to God and his work in our lives. Amen. Because he'll do that. Amen. But the devil is the one, right? So it's inside of us. The, the, the Lord allows the devil. Sometimes he comes by and he'll irritate something and bring something to the surface. Right? Not today, devil. Mark 8. We go to this other scripture here. And he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and scribes and be killed and after three days rise again. Okay, so Jesus began to reveal this to his disciples in Mark chapter 8. And he spoke this word openly. Then Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But when he had turned around and looked at his disciples, he rebuked Peter saying, Get behind me, Satan, for you are not mindful of the things of God, but of the things of men. So can you imagine Peter, I mean, rebuking Jesus? I mean, like, like here's supreme authority, right? Like this is... Can you imagine? Can you imagine rebuking Jesus yourself? I mean, like, like if I did, and I mean, ouch, right? So it's like, can you can you imagine that? Like Peter, foot and mouth. You know, Peter stumbled a lot. He did a lot of things, and he would do that, right? So in Peter's defense, though, he didn't have First Timothy five. Like First Timothy five wasn't written at this time. What does First Timothy five say? That says that you do not rebuke an elder, right? So maybe Peter didn't understand that he shouldn't rebuke an elder or kind of bring that to the attention or anything like that. But we do, right? So we have that. So Peter had greatness in him and loved the Lord. There, there's no doubt about that. When he was walking with me, he loved the Lord. As a matter of fact, his motive was to protect the Lord. Like, yeah. Jesus, this isn't going to happen. They're not going to deliver you up and kill you. I will defend you. Right. You know, that was kind of like Peter's motive. Mm -hmm. Motive, okay. Will and desire of what God had to accomplish, wrong. Like, right? Like, there's some things that God needs to accomplish, and Peter just didn't understand it because Peter didn't have the revelation. Right. He didn't have the understanding, okay? So Peter had greatness in him, and he loved the Lord. He just needed greater understanding in order to fulfill his purpose. Right? Peter preached and saved, what was it, 3,000, 4,000, something like that, in the book of Acts, right down the road. When Jesus told him and pulled him aside and says, if you love me, feed my sheep, right? But Peter loved him and cared for Jesus and cared about what he was doing. He didn't have the revelation that the, the, the Savior must die. Right. And so P, uh, so Jesus, in this, in this sense, was rebuking Satan, who was operating through Peter against the will of God and against what God wanted to do. Have you ever found yourself there? Have you ever found yourself doing something like that? It's like... You know, you're saying something, but you just don't have quite the understanding or what's going on or anything like that. And it's like, sometimes we foul up the will of God. You know, hey, newsflash, right? Like, the, the ways of God are not the ways of man. Like, the way God accomplishes things sometimes isn't the way we accomplish things. So sometimes we need to understand, take a step back and be like, whoa, hold on. The Lord. We need to follow the Lord, right? We need to follow what God is doing, even if it doesn't make sense. And when we're talking about a God... Who literally spit in in dirt and took it and rubbed it on a blind man's eyes? 
I'd say his ways are completely different than ours, right? Like I would, I wouldn't do that unless the Lord asked me to do that specifically. And I mean like audible voice with a couple of, uh, a couple of, uh, uh, reaffirmations, right? Like, let me know that that was you. I need to know that that was you because if I do this and it doesn't work, I'm probably going to get hit. <laughs> you know, I'm probably going to get one up the, you know, right here. So, you know, I like need to know that that was you because your ways are kind of a little different. Like, I'm not used to that. I wouldn't just choose to do it that way. I would have just said, hey, you're healed. Like he has done with some, right? right? Rise up and take up your mat and walk. Okay, we can try that. But I can tell you right now, unless the Lord tells me to do that, I would have a hard time. That's a lot of faith, right? Like if you say that and it doesn't happen, right. are you dishonoring God? I don't know. It's like, you know, it's just, that's a lot of faith. But hey, more power to you, right? But anyways, so, so, Point number two here, right, that I want to get, because G Peter's struggling with the will of God. He's like, he's going against the will of God, right? So unity, we talked a lot about that this morning. We talked about that with worship. We talked about that in his body. We've talked about that in his body over and over again. And I can tell the enemy tries to break up unity sometimes in pockets. I'm being very real and, 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 and direct here, right, with our own ministry, right? Like this happens sometimes, right? And it's like we got to recognize, see it, take a step back, and we can counteract that if we see it. If we don't see it, we've got the wrong perspective, and we don't see it, we can allow it to consume us, right? We can allow it to do so. Unity is not the lack of difference of opinion. Hey, difference of opinion is okay. We don't always have to agree. We don't always have to agree. It's okay, right? But it's coming together for a purpose that is greater than ourselves. Now, in honor of Pastor Brandon, who is who I got that from. I, I texted him this morning. I said, man, I'm not honoring you today. I'm using one of your sayings because it was great. I remember it, right? I remember this. I pay attention on Sunday service. He probably said that a couple of years ago, all right? So anyways, that is important, right? Like the purpose that we're here for and the mission that we're accomplishing is much greater than getting our point across. Amen. It is much greater than, right? And unity is important for that, right? Like we got to keep the unity together. I'm not talking about that coexistent unity garbage that's going on in the world that all the religions need to unify. No, no I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about us who believe that Jesus is Lord, right. right? Is the only way to heaven, believes the scriptures that says that he is the way, the truth, and the life, and no man's coming to the Father unless they come through him. That's the unifying power that we want. That's the group of people that we need to unify with, right? Like that's who we're following, okay? And so that's important. So difference of opinions are okay, but how they are expressed matters, okay? That matters. We must also be cognizant of the vision and make every attempt to deplete it. If we are recognizing what's going on, hey, sometimes it's not about getting the point right now. Sometimes it's just about taking a step back, having a conversation later, just doing something different and moving forward later, right? Can you imagine bodily function not subject to the mind can you imagine right like we are likened the church the, the organism of the church is called the body of christ right. and he is the head right can you imagine if my hand wasn't subject to the mind and didn't do whatever the mind told it to right or can you imagine the foot telling the hand don't do that <laughs> you know like the foot doesn't have that authority to do that right so it's like we need to like be very cognizant of what's going on and who we're following right and understand that there is an order to god right so the bodily function is always subject to the mind and to the head the bodily function is always subject to the mind and the head and so our function as a body is subject to the mind and the head right point number three I added this one on Will during, I think it was during service, so thanks Will for getting that. Um, recognizing and admitted, admitting what God is doing you in you is half the battle. Like, like first you have to recognize it and you have to know it. Like, you know, that, that's it. And then admitting, like, like that's kind of like that repentance thing or confess your faults one or another or confess your faults to the Lord, right? Like what's going on? And like, say, I remember, like I'm saying this, like truly, with several different things, stubbornness, um, you know, greed, all this. I, I, I remember sitting on my bed. I remember sitting in my prayer closet. I remember, like, these things would, like, come to the surface of me. So I'm not the only one, right? Like, or you're not the only one. I'm, I'm preaching to me, too. 
like I would remember these things would come to the surface and I would be out like in the early mornings praying and just like weeping because it's like you like fail God and you're like, Lord, I did this to you. I can't do this. I recognize this and I keep kind of struggling with this. And it's like, I don't want to fail you. I want to operate and do everything that you called me to, you know? And so recognizing and admitting what God is doing to you is half the battle. Once you've got that, now it's just pay. after that, the second half of the battle, I didn't put that in there, the second half of the battle is patience. I can <laughs> right? Remaining on the cross and allowing God's work to be done. So that's not point number three, but that's part of it, right? It's like, first you have to recognize it, admit it, confess it, and move and let God do the work. And then sometimes the patience is allowing God to do the work, and it might take some time. Like what God does in you and how he delivers you is his business. That's how he does it. I've seen God do a few things in my life and how he does it in my life. It's not always the same way he does it in everybody else. He can do that really quick. He can do that in a very long time. He can do that in a long, drawn-out process. But let us not be the ones that hinder the work of God. Right? Like, let us not be the ones that have to go around the mountain seven times before we actually get it, right? We have to go through the trial again, and we have to go through the trial again, and we don't have to. We go through the wilderness 40 years later, you know, instead of we could have what could have been done in 11 days, right? We would allow the Lord to do the work that he wants to do, and he could do it much quicker. So some practical things that we can do. You ready for this? And this isn't even up there. You're not gonna, I don't think you're going to see this. I don't think I gave this to Will. But some practical things that we can do. Uh, if you're taking notes or if you want to commit this to memory, it's really simple. Okay? Swallow this, digest it, allow it to kind of permeate your very soul. All right? James <laughs> chapter 4, verse 7. Submit to God. Resist the devil. Right? Right? Submit to God and resist the devil. Not today, devil. It ain't going to happen. Not today. Not next week. Not anytime. You're not going to cast me off. You're not going to disconnect me. I'm not going to be one of those fruitless branches that you cut off and cast into the fire. I'm not going to be one of those ones that are kind of, you know, uh, walking aimlessly or causing discord in the body or anything like that. I'm going to be one of those ones that submit to God and I'm going to resist the devil. And I'm going to resist his work and attempt in my life to try and separate me and to try and do things in my life that, is, that, that isn't intended, right? right? Like the, the devil is very real and he is trying and he is working over time and he hates what we're doing. Submit to his work in your life. This includes God's delegated authority. And please, I hate, it's hard. I, I think about pastors and, and think about those types of things, but it's like, this is important to say and I'll just say it, I mean, this is not like a thing, but God has delegated authority. And it's important to understand the authority in the church and to submit to those things as well, right? Like it's, imp it's important. Yeah. Um, and, and, and I learned that firsthand, right? Like under Pastor Brandon, like understanding that. I, I have shed a lot of tears I probably didn't need to shed because I was so stubborn, right? And so it's like, this includes God's delegated authority because God is a God of order. God, that was the first audible thing that God ever spoke to me. I am a God of order. He told that to me. And then he took me on like a three month plus journey, still I guess probably, but three months of intensive training on that. Like I'm a God of order. What he was telling me was get in line with it. You know what I mean? Like get in line with it. So submit to God, submit to his work in your life and submit to his delegated authority. But here's the other one, resist the devil. The devil will try and tug on the unyielded areas of our hearts. He will try and tug on unyielded areas of our hearts. When I said that here comes the devil, but he has nothing in me, that's what Jesus said, right? We should be very alive, very alive, uh, uh, cognizant of what is going on and what we need to yield to the Lord, right? Because he will deal with it. I understand and know that he wants to heal, deliver, and move in that way. That's why he walks around. You know this, right? The devil's been around for a long time. Eons. He's been studying man. He knows what man go through. He understands that man has fallen nature. He understands all of the envy, the pride, the lust, and all those things. And he puts these things before us, right? And it's like he works so hard. He works overtime. 
and he's trying to get to unyielded areas of our heart. If I can say one thing to you, and I, uh, uh, I remember saying this on uh, social media, I think there's a brother, and he's in this room, I don't want to embarrass him, but he asked me, and it was a good question. It was like, what does full surrender mean? If you were full surrender, wouldn't God get the work done in you immediately? That was a great question. I was like, I never thought of it like that. Like if I was fully surrendered to God, like we like to say we are, right? Like fully called, called and sold out to the Lord. Wouldn't he be able to get his work done like, bam, just done? And I thought to myself and I said, you know, I think what this what it means when we say that is to be fully surrendered in the season and the work that God's currently doing because he can't do it all at once in us, right? Like we need to yield to what he's doing today. What he's doing next week or next month or next year will probably be different if we progress. If we're not walking around the mountain seven times, right? If we progress and move forward in relationship with him and him delivering us and moving us forward, right? Then he'll be doing something different inside of us, right? But man, don't give him, don't give the enemy a foothold, right? He is way, he's a sneaky devil. He is, he's a sneaky devil in the way he works. But praise God, we have the Holy Spirit, yes. we have God Almighty, who knows how to work inside of us, reveal the enemy's work, and able to deliver us. If you can stand with me today. Much like Peter, we have greatness in us, too. Much like Peter, oh, thank you for that, yes. Much like Peter, we have greatness in us as well. And we have the opportunity to do great and mighty things. I know it sounds cliche, but the Lord has a plan for you and your life. Amen. And, it, and, it's, and it's not to be taken lightly. Like, like, I know I kind of emphasize this sometimes, but I just, I think it's important. Like, the creator of heaven and earth, hello. Like, come on now. Has called you to do something and to work and to be um, operative in his kingdom. Like, literally, he's got something planned for you. Okay? I mean, uh, I, I, th I think, this is just maybe just me, and I know we're human and I know that we're frail and I know that we kind of get going different directions and we're easily distracted and all those things. But I think that if the Lord of heaven and earth called us to something, I think it would be like so important that we would respond to it. Like, the one, I think of the parable of the pearl of great price, that when he found that pearl of great price, he cast everything aside and he went after that treasure. He went after that. He all That's all he sought is he wanted that pearl of great price. And that's the, that's the Lord, right? That we would go after him and what he has for us. That we would go after him and find out what his perfect will is for us. That we would lay everything down and allow everything that hinders us within to be dealt with so that we have nothing inside of us. Amen. Bow your heads. Father, we thank you. We thank you for your Holy Spirit. To guide, comfort, to lead us, and to teach us in all truth. To empower us, to strengthen us, and enable us to overcome. God, we thank you, Lord, that you are much greater than the enemy. And I think it's important we understand that the enemy is much greater than us, but he's not greater than Christ in us. So, Lord, I pray that we would keep an eye focused on you, that we would see you for who you are. I pray that you would open up our hearts and our eyes to see you as you are, to follow you, to be called to what you have for us, God, to resist the devil, to submit ourselves to God, to his authority, and to, uh, and to resist the devil, and to fulfill our God-given purpose in, your, in our lives, God, that life that you've given us. So, Lord, we just pray. God, I pray the Holy Spirit would fall upon people's lives today. Strengthen, encourage, and bless. 
God, I thank you, Lord, for the uh, the Holy Spirit that reveals the enemy's work, helps us to see it. Thank you for your battle plan in the Bible, Lord, that you reveal to us how he operates so that we can uh, see these things and that we can actually stand up and we have the authority to say, no, devil, not today. Not today, not next week, not next month. You're not going to cast us off. You're not going to get us... Uh, off track. We have a God who is much greater. We give you all the praise and the glory. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Um, if you could, really quickly, I know that um, you can turn it off.